Hi everyone and welcome to the IMCSP podcast from me, Miriam Scarpa, and today also Lydia will be hosting with me. Hi, um, nice to yeah. nice to host again with you. I'm the work-life balance coordinator here at the Institute and my role is about understanding some of the challenges we're facing with work-life balance and develop initiatives to help combat some of these issues. Thank you. So this podcast is the third episode of this short series about work-life balance in our institute and academia in general. And today we'll be having a chat with PIs and a chief technician of our institute. Yeah. Hi, everyone. So my name is Matt Jones. Uh, I am a senior lecturer uh, here in the institute and also the Athena Swan champion. Um, so my research background is in circadian photobiology, so I'm interested in how plants in particular respond to environmental cues at different times of day and how we can exploit that information. Hey, hi, I'm Pallon Walden and I am a structural biologist and my research area of interest is in ubiquitin signalling and how cells use ubiquitin in order to drive pretty much every process. Hello, and my name is Yuli Kaiserly and I'm also a senior lecturer. So my job role involves both research and teaching. Um, in terms of research, uh, we focus on plant molecular biology, and in particular, my lab investigates how environmental stimuli, such as light and temperature, regulate plant development. And in particular, we're interested in processes that happen in the nucleus, so regulation of gene expression in particular. So in, in terms of teaching, I mostly teach uh, undergraduates, uh, final year undergraduate students and supervise undergraduate and postgraduate research projects. And uh, my working pattern is um, at the moment is part-time. So I'm uh, 0.8 FT, 0.8 full-time basically, since I returned from maternity leave. Hi, I am, I'm John Christie. I'm a professor of plant photobiology. So my research focuses on how plants detect and respond to their light environment. So I'm a plant molecular biologist, so much of our, our research focuses on uh, molecular signaling, but also our research is focused on um, exploiting the information we gain about plant photoreceptors and making uh, new tools to regulate protein activities by, by light. I also have a role as co-deputy director of the Institute, and I have teaching uh, responsibilities both at the undergraduate and postgraduate level. Hi, I'm Paul Patterson. I'm the chief technician for uh, the Institute. I'm also the convener of uh, health and safety. My main role is managing the technical staff and obviously the health and safety around the, the Institute. I've been in the university 43 years now, so I've been around a bit. I've worked in physiology, I've worked in the teaching group, and now I'm in the, I will still call it biochemistry. I don't know if it still is. <laughs> I said, hi, my name is uh, Timo Kurtz. I'm also a senior lecturer. And uh, my research interest is really focused on the ubiquitin proteasome system and how it regulates many aspects of cellular biology and in particular how you know, defects in the system causes disease. Um, on top of our research, I'm also doing quite a bit of undergraduate teaching. I coordinate level four biochemistry, have my own uh, level four option and also do a bit of postgraduate teaching. Thank you so much. It's really great to have such a diverse panel with us today. Perhaps it would be really nice to just have a summary of the recent work-life balance we work-life balance survey we've done. And um, what we found was that overall staff were quite happy with their managers and um, their ability to undertake training and develop their careers. But of course, there were also some of the challenges um, that we noted in the previous two podcasts, including you know, the pressure, particularly PhDs and research and training staff feel about working when it comes lab working, publishing and grants, but also the high frequency of presenteeism. So the tendency of having to stay in work beyond the times needed for an effective job performance. That was some of the things that were highlighted. And of course, we also found that increases stress levels and has a potential negative impact on mental health. Perhaps it would be helpful to have some comments here from Matt because I know that he has had a had a look at the survey as well. Thanks Lydia. Yeah so um, clearly these results are almost what we would expect to see right but I think the, the the big issue really comes down to presenteeism right so I mean there's a big difference between being in lab and being productive and being in lab because you feel you have to be there and this is um, the cultural change that I think we need to um, start addressing. 
Uh, one of the key issues, I think, about this is, is that academia is vocational for many. And so it's not something that I personally do for money, but kind of I, I have bills and responsibilities for family that I have to, to deal with. Um, and so, but what we need to do is trying to find, find a way of making the culture so that people are doing what they want to do and they're able to do that with the support, support of their managers. And um, I think one of the key ways to address this is to start having a bit more managerial training to try and remind people they need to create this kind of in inclusive inclusive environment where people are, are doing what they want to do and so support them to find their own research niche if that's what they want to find or also recognizing that academia isn't for everyone right so we have to be a lot more explicit about saying that academia isn't for everyone but that um, a research career gives you so many transferable skills that you're able to take um, away with you but uh, finding a way to emphasize that and support those transitions are, are just as important um, yeah, I guess we, we're talking about um, work-life balance, but I guess there's work balance as well when you think about the workload model. Um, so I guess for me, I'm personally, I'm, I'm kind of a bit of a perfectionist. So, and this is one thing that really kind of holds me back because um, it, it, it makes you sort of less efficient sometimes in terms of balancing between different different uh, workloads. But we we have a, a lot of teaching responsibilities, but also administration resp responsibilities as well. Um, so, uh, and so, and dividing that with the research, as Matt, Matt said, I think a lot of us got into academia because we were really driven by our research and we think of that as a vocation. And that's where we really kind of really enjoy things and um, not, not saying that we don't enjoy teaching at all. I mean, it's very rewarding, but um, I think that's what still drives a lot of us is making those um, steps forward in research and bringing in and um, sort of building up your research group, making those discoveries. Um, and dividing that time to do that well and balance um, the, the, the other attributes that we have, such as teaching and uh, administration, is, is very difficult. How we, how we do that through a pandemic <laughs> adds an, another dimension <laughs> as well. So I'm, I guess you'll get more information from the others. It's been a, a difficult year, I think, in terms of um, juggling both uh, work and, and life, life at home. Or especially, well, Irini, if you have uh, any comments on this, also regarding, um, well, coming back, for example, from maternity leave and also juggling research. Right, yeah. So just before I, I, I came back from return, uh, returning from maternity leave, uh, I decided to return to apply for uh, uh, the flexible working scheme that is available at the University of Glasgow, which is actually great. And it's something I wasn't considering initially before I went to maternity leave. And um, I mean, in, in my case, I think this allowed me to, to focus on uh, the teaching responsibilities initially and also get back to, to research. And um, at the same time, this transition was quite smooth uh, for myself, but primarily for our son uh, that started at the university nursery. So yeah, I think Something that returned to maternity leave is that you need to prioritize, be a bit more organized, prioritize your your time and um, and work in a more efficient and smart way. Uh, and also, I mean, in most ways, is um, try to not to become selfish, but try to learn to say no to maybe to tasks that uh, would drain a lot of uh, your time uh, from more impactful uh, tasks. Um, so, so this is something that um, I'm still learning and, um, and how to do because I think it's uh, it's difficult, especially if you try to to help colleagues and um, yeah, be nice and collegiate basically within the institute. And um, also in terms of uh, trying to maintain a work-life balance, I think this is something that is quite hard. Uh, obviously, you know, when you return home and you, you spend some time uh, with uh, your child, you are focused on, uh, on them, right? Because you can't do anything else. So in some ways, that's great because it takes off your mind from anything that is related to work. But on the, on the other hand, I feel that I usually uh, need to work after the hours that I'm not designated, let's say, that traditional working hours uh, in order to complete specific tasks, whether it's teaching or research, because as everyone so far has mentioned, um, you know, what we do, our role and research is a passion, it's not uh, something we do just as a job. So it's that something we really want to, to do well, uh, if we can. And in my case, trying to catch up from uh, the time that I was away from work, I think it's really important. Sorry, maybe I can jump in real quick, because I thought you made a very important point there, Irene. Um, the learning to say no, I think, is something that that maybe we should talk a little bit about because that's uh, you know something that I've noticed is a challenge. But 
extremely necessary, particularly in a university that's structures as ours, where we have a lot of small, you know, units that organize their own work and that are constantly looking for other people to help out because the workload is so high, right? And um, I'm sure that most of you, uh, just like myself, are constantly, maybe not constantly, but quite frequently asked to perform additional tasks by your colleagues, right? And you, you want to help out. But I've noticed if you say yes, which is what you would like to do, but if you say yes all the time, there's no way you can fit it all under one umbrella. And then on top of that, you have your own research and, and the family. So, so, so this learning to say no, I think, is a very, very critical point. And I don't think I'm good at it. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know if someone else is and, and how, they, you know, how they've learned to do it. Um, but, but it's a critical aspect, I think. Yeah, so I was just going to share a couple of thoughts, maybe touching on some of those points, Timo. I think um, I was given some great advice years and years ago, which is for time management, work out how long something's going to take, double it and add an hour. And that is how I, it's the first thing I teach my new PhD students and postdocs. Um, and it is how I approach absolutely everything. So whenever I am given uh, or a request for a new task to do. I work out how long I think it's going to take. <laughs> I double it and add an hour. And that makes it very easy for me to see if I can fit it in the capacity <laughs> that I've got at the time. And it sounds quite a joke, but you know, I have two children. They are aged 13 and 11. I have managed to maintain um, you know, a relatively successful research and academic career during that time. And the point being that work-life balance is different for every single person, right? So you know, my partner works in a hospital and is often on call over Christmas. So when many people complain about grant deadlines in January, and as if it's self-evident that this is an awful time for a grant deadline, for me, they are perfect. That is the best grant deadline I could possibly have is the beginning of January because I don't have anything else I really need to be doing <laughs> over the Christmas period. And so I think that what you're saying, Timo, about learning to say no is you really have to know yourself and the way you work best in order to be able to fit such competing demands in. And that's why I think management training is so important, um, as Matt brought up at the beginning. Thank you so much. These are really, really helpful suggestions. Do you guys think that perhaps it's harder for early career researchers and PhDs to say no or that they feel more pressure? And if so, how can you communicate to them that something they can and ought to do? My advice would be to, to ECRs is to take on tasks that you, you really want to do. <laughs> so those tasks that you're interested in. So if you're thinking about, say, taking teaching responsibilities, yeah, teach something that you want to teach. Um, you will be asked to do things, but uh, it, it's better if you go ahead and build up your sort of portfolio of teaching if you're doing something that you know something about and something that you enjoy. So um, that would be one example that I would give to, to ECRs. Yeah, just thinking back to my postdoc, which um, disappears further and further into the past, right? But I think John's right, and it kind of comes back to this common theme, you have to be doing something that you want to do. Right, so, so the key really is for it to not feel like it's an onerous task that you're doing, right? So if it's a, an experiment that you, you don't see, see the point in, it's going to take you five times longer th than not. If you've been asked to do some teaching that you don't really want to do, then it becomes a drain on you rather than being something that you actually want to do and you're actually encouraged to do. So I think it's okay to say that. I think it's a good idea to know where you want to get to. Right, so you need to have a clear idea about whether you want to stay in academia. If you do, what kind of niche do you want to be in and what can you be doing to create that niche for yourself um, alongside the experiments that you have to do for the grant that you're currently being paid on. Right? And it, being an ECR is really, really difficult because you end up being employed to do a, re, like a research project that isn't necessarily where you want to end up. And so trying to find the time to do your own stuff alongside the stuff that you're contracted to do is the challenge and in my personal experience uh, I didn't have this problem because I was paid on soft money in the states which was amazing because I went there and was just told to get on with it um, so, so um, but in the UK the UK system is very different there, there's that circle you need to square almost and, and, and trying to find peace with that is a is a is a, is a, is a recommendation i would have right why is it you're, you're you're doing the phd or the postdoc that you're doing what do you enjoy about it and then what else can you be doing that would help you develop your own interests yourself 
Thank you. That's actually that's, uh, all very helpful comment and probably something I myself as well can take home and think about. And just want to ask Paul a question. So we established that uh, this work life imbalance and uh, exists like, in uh, academia. And uh, how could you comment on how this might reflect like challenges uh, that support a technician and admin staff might face? I think um, in terms of work-life balance, I would say the general thing is I think it changes, I think, as people's careers go on. It may change when people have children, they may have caring duties, they may decide they want to, to only work three days a week, four days a week. Um, looking from the outside in terms of ECRs, I think it's what expectations are put on them, particularly by you know, maybe their supervisor, no, their supervisor did X when they were doing their career, they maybe expect the ECR to do exactly the same thing as they did. And it might not, you know, everybody's, I think we have to, we have to work out that everybody's different. In terms of technical staff, I think, again, there is a, a, an area where people like to work in a certain area of research. And we find this because we will say there's a full-time job going in such and such, and they're maybe on a grant. They say, no, I really like working here and I'm really interested in it. So that is one of the things that can come up. In terms of work-life balance, we really do try and adapt to where we are. We've got a really, the PIs, I must say, are very, very good in our institute in, in responding to things. You know, if somebody suddenly wants to change their work pattern, they maybe have to take a Wednesday off for, for a month or so. We're very, very good at doing those kind of things. Um, we've got a lot of successes with um, people who have taken career breaks, maybe to go and, and you know, have their family to grow up. And we've got really, really good examples. For example, when we started in here, there was no female grade sevens at all, none at all. That was 10 years ago. Now the balance is, I think, four and four, and it might even be one more. Grade seven. Now, virtually every one of those um, women have taken time out at times to go part time and then come back. Some of them are still four days a week, five days. So that is a really good, the work life balance there is really, really good. We have had occasions where people have been doing, trying to do too much. And I think it's, you have to be aware of that as a manager to actually say, you know, I can see they're doing far too much. You know, they're coming in every weekend, they're doing this, that. They maybe want to do it. But you have to kind of say to them, you know, take a wee step back or whatever. But, you know, in terms of, um, I think the technical staff have a very good work-life balance in here. I'm speaking generally about it. I think if you speak to them, there are times that it does get a bit hectic. You know? But I think it's, again, it's managing expectations of what, of what people, I think if you have people in and, and they're not, they're maybe edgy because, you know, they're worried about their children or they're worried about care or they're worried about something else. I don't think you get value out of that, I think. And that's where you have to respond um, as managers. But I can see, I mean, there's a total difference between the support staff and things like ECRs, because that whole career climb is very, very steep. Whereas with the technical staff, it can be quite slow and we go along and, you know, you can build your career up. But it just seems to me, and I don't know how the other academics here feel about it, I just feel the ECRs is a really, really steep climb. You know, you've got to do it within a really short period. That's what I think from the outside. Yeah, I have a quick, I mean, it is a steep climb. I agree with Paul. It's a, I, I, for that period of your career where you, you're, you're trying to really establish yourself yeah. at the academic level, both in research and, and teaching. And I guess what's really, can be really supportive is a good mentorship within the work environment. And that's something that we've tried to instill and improve within the Institute. So I think that's where giving the help that the ECRs need at a very early stage is a, is a very important point. I do agree with that. Um, I think I've been really lucky with my supervisors and I kind of, I, I was given this advice of what to do. So for example, put yourself forward with abstracts or extra kind of, but oh, still extracurricular talks or uh, trying to up to get some positions in societies and all these kind of um, things that help build a network around you of 
uh, in the community of researchers, but also make you competitive at a CV level. But I don't think everyone has that. And I do think that a mentorship uh, program would definitely benefit everyone. Yeah, so Matt, would you like to comment on the new mentoring scheme? I think, are you involved? So I'm tangentially involved, but so this is something that Sophie's been, Sophie Bradley's been working on, been yeah. pulling together. So I think, but I think this is going to be very um, important going forward, right? Because we do need to have more of an of an opt out scheme, of an, an opt in. Because at least when I when I was a postdoc, right, I was focused on the research and not necessarily on the the mentorship and and, and the building blocks and the support outside of that. Whereas I think it, if we encourage people to do that more strongly, then I think that will help a lot. So the mentorship scheme that's being set, set up at the moment is that. Every PhD student will have a postdoc mentor and every postdoc will have an academic mentor to try and give a, a, a progression. I think it's really important that the ECRs, which I'm going to class as, as a postdoc for now, they have they gain experience in mentoring others as well as receiving mentorship themselves. So I think you, you do learn a lot from both sides of that equation. And then, of course, we're also allowing academics to receive mentorship within the institute as well. So... Uh, again, not really pursued that strongly myself, but I think it, it's going to be more important for me. That it, the more training that I receive, the more val valuable I think a mentorship relationship is going to be for me, and more formal one is going to be. So, um, ho hopefully, this will help everyone um, as we we go forwards. I just wanted to 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 touch on the workload model again, and I, bringing up the point that Timo had mentioned about you, you tend to take on tasks because you're asked, and um, these sort of build up and just. Spinning it back from the managerial perspective, I mean, balancing that work is um, not an, an easy task because cataloging uh, all the activities of, of staff and getting that information is something that we are trying to do at the moment. Um, but it's it's not it's not an easy task to do. But once we have that information, then it's it's easy to look. Um, we have a fairly small institute compared to to other institutes within the college university. Um, but even it's a it's a hard task for us and getting that information will allow us to to balance workloads across different staff so i just wanted to kind of raise that point from a different a different managerial perspective thank you very much actually that brings us to sort of um some of your thoughts of how you're actively managing your work-life balance but also i guess what would be really interesting to find out is the support you as senior academics have from the university or the institute you have been finding quite helpful or useful or some of the initiatives perhaps also that are happening on the higher university levels that are going to make a difference or? I think that it is one of the interesting things about an academic career is that the head of a lab is kind of left to get on with doing things however they see fit and there isn't perhaps the same level of uniformity that you might have in some other industries for want of a better word and I think personally in the University of Glasgow which is one of many places I've worked I feel I personally feel very supported to run my lab however I see fit and I would hope that the members of staff in my lab uh, also feel that they are treated as my co-workers. We are all here to do some science. I see it as my job to raise the cash and, and hopefully shield them from all the other stuff you have to do, like the teaching, the marking, the et cetera, et cetera. But I don't know that that is how, you know, I don't think everybody approaches it in the same way. <laughs> so I wonder, I've worked in other institutes where the culture is quite different and it is always about how it goes at the top. If the culture at the top is one of presenteeism, of, uh, you know, I work 67 hours a day and if you don't do that, you won't be successful. Um, if that is the, if that's the attitude of the people at the top, I, I think it's, I actually think it's quite hard to change a culture from underneath. Um, that's not to say we shouldn't try. And I think that one of the wonderful things about this institute in particular is that is always a lot of buy-in from the staff to to make you know, people respond to the surveys 
people want to try to make a difference and people are, you know, I think in the main willing to put the work in to do so. So I, th I think I'd leave it to, to Lydia to describe some of the uh, some of the actual schemes that are ongoing, but there are schemes available to try to help managers manage in a more appropriate way for the diversity of staff they have. Thank you so much, Helen. That's really great. And hopefully we, uh, we will take uh, some of the initiatives forward in the future and hear more about them on hopefully this podcast as well in a part four. Um, any other comments on uh, how you are managing your work-life balance and also what the university is doing to support that in a, in a sort of wider way? For me personally? Anyone, yeah. really. <laughs> I, I would say, so, uh, you yeah, know, my work-life balance has been bonkers for the last year. Uh, my husband works in a hospital. He has been out at work every day and I have been single parent sole in charge of two children <laughs> I've had to get them through one of them finished primary school and started secondary school during this pandemic um, it has been hell on earth um, <laughs> and you know so I, I have to I don't struggle with saying no if somebody asks me to do something that I really don't think I've got capacity to do I just say that I just you know I'm a human being I just say I genuinely don't have capacity to do that I'm very sorry um ask me next week even you know <laughs> but uh, I don't think I feel any more pressure than anybody else does if I'd had really young children I think it would have been worse <laughs> so, you know, I think that everybody has like I think I said at the start I think work-life balance isn't a one size fits all right because everybody's work is different and everybody's life is different and so because of that you know what you really need is empathetic leadership in my opinion yeah I completely agree with uh, what Helen said and and also in particular about the fact that uh, I think the University of Glasgow and our institute has an excellent and very supportive environment and uh, and framework also for flexible working if if needed and and as as Helen pointed out there are places that sometimes this is not a priority work life balance is not really a priority and um, I mean the great thing about Glasgow is that obviously people still do great science and great teaching and still try to maintain a healthy work-life balance and, um, and and also in addition to people at the top I, I, I think our colleagues also uh, give um, uh, great examples or the great role models in, in terms of try to to maintain this healthy work balance uh, and it's greatly supported by everyone and also for our early career researchers not just for the academics and, uh, and I think this is something that many of us probably discuss, uh, in particular during the pandemic, uh, with early career researchers uh, to, to try to en encourage them to take time off if needed, even though they felt that they've lost a lot of time because of the pandemic. So, no, I think the culture and the environment at Glasgow is really supportive and um, this is really important. And I think we're very lucky, actually, in many ways to work here. Thank you. And well, this actually answers one of the questions that the ECR has raised uh, in the last podcast, which was if the PIs and yeah feel supported in supporting their uh, their own staff to achieve an healthy work life balance. But I think we established that there's a good network and framework in the University of Glasgow to support that. So that's that's great. Actually, I don't think ECRs are aware of this actually, and it's really nice to know. And one, ad, one other of the question would like to hear from you how your work life well, work <laughs> balance looks like. So I echo what Helen says that everyone's different. So <clears throat> maybe perhaps it's informative for me to give my per personal <laughs> working system. So I, I have two, two kids um, who are seven and two. Um, but my wife is is un unemployed at the moment, so that, that helps a lot on, on the childcare side of things. So I end up working probably from eight till five thirty is my normal working day, and then I, I work a half day on the weekend as well. And that is my own personal choice. No one's telling me to do that, but that's kind of where where my personal comfort level is, right? Um, and I find that that half day on the weekend gives me some breathing space that I can actually think about what, what I'm supposed to be doing and, and you know 
undisturbed almost because during the week there's always stuff going on and no one's told me that i have to do this but the, you know when i tried to to not do that because you know clearly the kids are at home and on the weekend and i i, I do miss out on some things but i i think that actually it's better for my own mental health for me, <laughs> for me to do that because it, it, it helps me enjoy my work a lot more um and so that's how i uh, approach things basically yeah maybe i'll uh, <clears throat> give my experience and i think what everyone said, what Helen said, and what Matt said, just that it's different for everyone. I think that's true. And I, I also think, at least in my case, uh, my work by uh, life balance also changes throughout the year. Uh, it very heavily depends on what's currently on the plate and, uh, you know, what needs to get done. And I, I think the best example is maybe just, you know, these last months when, you know, the, the exams are coming in, you know, there's a lot of undergraduate teaching happening. And on top of this, you know, particularly this year with the pandemic, it was kind of tricky um, because the, uh, you know, if you're also teaching postgraduate and undergraduate, the postgraduates uh, had shifted for a few months. So actually a lot of the assessments and workloads, they kind of clashed into each other. So there was all of a sudden a lot to do, right? With um, marking and uh, teaching. And then on top of that, you write a grant. And at that point, you know, uh, there's, a, there, there's a chunk of time where actually, you know, the balance is heavily skewed towards work, right? At least in my case. Uh, but then again, you may have some time in the year where, where that's shifted a bit because things have eased up, you know, the teachings maybe just getting started, you know, there's no exam, it's nothing to mark quite yet. So, so it's a little bit easier. So, so it, it really depends on what time of year you're looking at, at least in my case, uh, you know, if you were, if you ask me how, how heavy, you know, is, is, is each load. So it's a, it's a constant and very, I think, fluctuating dynamic situation that you always try and, and make worse as, work as best as you can. And uh, I have to say, and again, I, I, I want to emphasize this, uh, that what everyone else has said, that actually the university is extremely supportive also in that flexibility. Okay, so there's no one there, you know, that, that tells you, you know, the prep, and, and just like Helen and, and some others, I've worked in places where pressure was applied, you know, 100% of the time. Uh, and this is not the case here. Uh, you know, you definitely have your freedom to adjust your own work-life balance as you see fit and as, as is needed. And that's, a, at least in my case, greatly appreciated. Yeah, in my case, my working pattern, as I mentioned, is, uh, is part-time at, at the moment. So my working hours are nine to approximately three o'clock. So I usually pick up my, my son from, uh, from nursery around uh, 3.30 and then we walk back home. I, this gives me time to do some cooking and spend some time with him. And um, usually I try to work a little bit in the evening if it's possible and especially if there's specific deadlines or uh, something related to my research or teaching that uh, is of high priority or otherwise I'll try to do some um, commitments that are not directly related uh, to research and teaching so whether it's you know editorial reviewing you know things that again we we select to do because we're interested uh, in doing uh, on weekends again it depends if there are deadlines and um, I, I need to work then we figure it out because uh, my husband John is also an academic so we figure out you know who is gonna do the daycare and uh, who is gonna uh, do some work depending on uh, our deadlines and our priorities so yeah like everyone uh, mentioned you know uh, work-life balance is different for individuals so we just have to adapt and uh, and we make it work in the end of the day yeah I guess I can follow Irini then, <laughs> since we're married. Um, I, I, the pandemic and I guess uh, having our son, um, who's almost two, has obviously changed our working health, the life balance um, situation. Uh, this year, I, I come, <laughs> Helen, yeah, it's been much of a deer in the headlights. <laughs> um, you just kind of really adapt very quickly and deal with uh, situations, especially in the lockdown when we were both had heavy teaching loads. Um, Jason wasn't at nursery, so we had to accommodate each other, basically pass them to each other. It's your turn to teach, I'll take it now. Um, but you get through it. I think it really teaches you to be very efficient and organized. Um, personally, what I struggle with, and I think it's um, a great thing about the job that you realize from an early stage is you, you've got a lot of flexibility. The university, the, the, the jobs that we have, 
the working hours, you, you can get sort of really good flexibility in that and, and integrate that with your life. But the problem there is that you tend to lose boundaries <laughs> between the two. They get very blurred and it, and it has done so over the past year, obviously. And I find personally, I find that difficult to separate those out. I, I would say Rini's really much better <laughs> at doing that than me. And it, it does impact your, your work. And Helen touched on this before briefly about having a bit of time <laughs> to focus on grant applications. And as, as researchers, you need that kind of time, that creativity <laughs> to, as Matt mentioned, to step back and, and think <laughs> um, yeah, and, and, and formulate um, your research and formulate your grant application. And it gets really hard to do that when you're, as Timo mentioned, when other attributes of the job, you've got a really big, big workload um, at the time of year where it's um, exam time, lots of teaching, marking. So I would say, yeah, if you can build up those boundaries and compartmentalize, um, it, it will help. But you need that flexibility as well in your life to, to do both, <laughs> look after your family and also be successful in your, in your job. It's so interesting because I actually also have a colleague who actively takes time out to just creatively think. Um, so he's doing half a day each, each week to just think and to not have anything on his to-do list and to just sort of ponder things. And I think he said to me that really takes him back to when he had more time for that because he didn't have so many other things to do. But in terms of creativity and innovation, that has been really helpful to develop some of this research. And I thought that was so interesting to sort of invite boredom and free time in for at least some of the time you have. Thank you. Really, really interesting comments there. I just say one thing about like just in terms of what life balance. What I can get, what I think I've discovered over the years is don't try and do everything yourself. You're gonna trust people below you. If you've got a really good network below you and let people go on with things. Obviously you have to keep an eye on it, but you let people go on with things because I tried to do everything myself, answered all emails at weekends and things like that. And you just get nowhere. You end up you're just on this cycle and things like that. Nothing like in academia, and I think the pressures in particular in academia and ECRs to get grants, they've got responsibilities in terms of trying to keep their group employed and all the things that go around about that. But my, the only thing I would say to me was trust people and get a really good network below you. I've got a really good, excellent senior manager, technical managers below me. People don't believe me when I go on holiday and I come back and I haven't got that many emails to deal with because everybody's dealt with my way. My wife thinks I've kind of almost made myself redundant, but that's, that's just another thing. That, that's what I would say, and, and I think Timo made a really good point, and I think this is where it comes in. I think if your PI, if your senior managers have a good work-life balance or they feel that they can have the flexibility for a work-life balance, that filters down to the group. So it filtered out the ECRs, or where ECRs, technicians, whoever, will feel that they can go to their PI or come to me or whatever and say, listen, I've got a problem on a Friday for a couple, for a month or so, you know, I need to do this, that, and the next thing. And I, I've very seldom heard it, in fact, I've never heard anybody where they've said no. And I think that is, Timo, I think that really struck home with me when he said he felt that he had support that he could do that. So he will then, Helen and Matt and Irene and, and, and John, they will then pass that down. So I think that's really important that that culture, as Helen says, is at the top or within the group and it does get filtered down. That's what I would say. But the only thing I would say to Andy was just get a really good support network and just, you know, trust people to do things and let them go on with it. And don't try and do everything yourself. Thank you, that's a really great comment. And I think it also highlights that importance of feeling comfortable to ask and voice and share how people feel and what pressures they are under and feeling that they can do that with their PI or their management. And I think in just having these conversations here, it encourages people to be a little bit more perhaps vulnerable to do exactly that. Thank you, it's really, really good comment. Um, we're also interested in how you guys feel the sort of relationship between work and life and 
staying on and late nights has changed? Have you guys felt like things are improving and people are being encouraged? Or do you guys think this has been pretty much a status quo situation? I mean, maybe I can talk of my own, speak of my own experience, you know, when, I mean, for me, this has definitely changed. It used to be that, you know, not only my work life, but my social life was in the lab. So when I was a PhD and a postdoc, everything happened in and around the lab. You know, even if you went out, you know, in the evening, it's usually with your lab mates and sometimes it would pop into the lab at 10 p.m. to get that time point or, you know, something like this. And then and, and this was your life. You know, I talk about work-life balance that, there, there were no boundaries. It was all blurred. And it was also fun at times. You know, it wasn't necessarily, like not only at times, it was fun, in fact, right? You had fun, you had fun with your lab mates and you just, you just enjoyed what you were doing. But as you get older, I think your responsibilities change and also your outlook changes. And, you know, it depends on, that may happen to different people at different times. And, you know, you know you're no longer 25, I'm not. And I, I, I don't want to have this kind of fun all the time. I also have other responsibilities with family. And, you know, at that point, I think you, you need to readjust your life and your work-life balance. And, and that has certainly happened for me. And I think what we need to be aware of that these changes and may happen for different people at different times. And they may never have, you know, this desire to be in the lab all the time and just have fun in the lab. You know, for some people it's work and that's what it is. It's interesting work. But then there's also other things that I need to just decompress, right, and do other things. And, and we need to accommodate for this. So again, I think there's a dynamic in this for everyone. And this dynamic is different, right? And I think for us as managers, it's just important to realize that, to be aware that people that we manage have different requirements to ourselves and that they have different experiences to ourselves that, that we have. And once we have this, and I think, Helen, empathy, that's the word you used. I think that's the important bit. We need to be empathetic, not necessarily always sympathetic, but certainly empathetic. And then, you know, on that, we need to make our decisions. And I think that's really the important bit, I think, to realize. Thank you. That was really nice. Does anyone else would like to, everyone I think was nodding and probably agreed uh, with Timo. But yeah, thanks very much. You made very great points. Um, I think uh, we will wrap up now. Uh, thanks again uh, for doing this with us. And we usually finish with a fire round of questions. So I like to do this quickly now. And I will just fire the questions. So favorite food. <laughs> <laughs> it's got to uh, be a plan. <laughs> <laughs> Creme brulee. <laughs> Sushi. Ice cream. Oh, moussaka. <laughs> uh, curry. I sometimes really miss my German home food, so I say <laughs> Esch <Wetzler. laughs> Favourite city? Glasgow. Jerusalem. Mm, San Francisco. San Diego. Uh, Rome. Portland, Oregon. Because uh, Helen stole Jerusalem from me. Favorite musician and or genre? Train. Pet shop boys. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, oh God, uh, Robert Palmer. <laughs> well, the uh, boring one. <laughs> uh, Sex Pistols. I've been listening to a lot of Leonard Cohen lately. Any instruments you play? So I sing, I used to sing, but uh, guitar I did for a long time, no longer. Yeah, I can play guitar, like violin. <laughs> the xylophone with my son. <laughs> <laughs> must be very talented. I, I, did, I, did, I did try the guitar because I wanted to be a punk rocker and a band, but my fingers get sore and I gave up very, very quickly. <laughs> So rock and roll. <laughs> yeah. We had to play the recorder in school, but that's the last time I touched an instrument. And favourite sport? American football. To support football, to do, run. Horse riding. I would say squash until I got a squash ball in the eye. <laughs> so running. <laughs> that was my second. <laughs> well, as my wife would tell you, um, it's football, football, and football. <laughs> Very one-dimensional. 
I love to watch football, and uh, since moving to Scotland, I freely got into hill walking. So I have to say that's my favorite to do. Favorite film? Shawshank Redemption. Yeah, so I'm not. I'm not into films. I don't have a favorite film. Uh, the Big Blue. It's a Wonderful Life. Good films. So many good films. I mean, I. I would have to say, yeah, so anything Quentin Tarantino I enjoy. Mm -hmm. On fiction. <laughs> <laughs> and favorite TV show? Star Trek. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I like all sorts of TV. I don't know. MacGyver, the original. Though. <laughs> I can be a bit of a Netflix junkie, so I'll say Narcos. <laughs> I must, I must admit, I don't, I haven't seen any of these box sets that everybody talks about. I'm still watching UK Gold and things like that. I watch reruns of things. But my favourite ever is Faulty Towers. I still laugh at that. I've watched that like 200 times. It's just, that, that's my favourite of all. Yeah, that's, that's a difficult one for me. I think the last box that I watched in, in full was Breaking Bad, which I thought was outstanding. But then lately I've been watching a silly show on... Australian gold mining. So <laughs> <laughs> that keeps me entertained in the evening. It's uh, maybe not most culturally, you know, interesting, but it's certainly, it's just, just digging for gold in the mud rather than uh, <laughs> trying to write down a grant to get it. Uh, it's maybe what I enjoy. <laughs> That's a bit like research, Timo, isn't it? I know, I know. <laughs> Okay, the last one uh, is the fa our favorite book. Okay, so following on from Star Trek, I'm a bit of a sci-fi nerd, so space opera is my thing when I get time to read. So any anything that's written across several volumes set, set in space is for me. Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. The Great Gatsby was something I yeah had always like going back to. <laughs> I really enjoyed the Travis McGee detective novels by John Me and John D. McDonald. And there's an author now, Scott William Carter, that writes on Garrison Gage um, detective series. So that's that's what I'm reading at the moment. I, I'm a terrible reader. Uh, my wife can go through books like Nobody's Business and Holiday, and she says you're still at page forty or something like that. But um, anything by John Grisham, really, really enjoy that. I think. I guess for me, it's just things that really had an, an, an impact on me when I was young, when I was reading a lot of Milan Berra. So anything by him, the unbearable likeness of being, maybe. Well, thank you, everyone. It's been really nice to hear more about you, your work-life balance and, and something personal about you. And thanks a lot again for recording this podcast with us. And yeah, I think there's a wrap up. So thanks, everyone. And thanks to everyone who listened to this. Bye. Bye, thank you. Bye, Mariam. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.